my folks didn't have much, hardworking, good people, but just didn't have a whole lot. Uh, they worked hard every day, did the best they could. And really the point that my life turned around, I was in eighth grade, and I walked into my junior high school civics class in the eighth grade, and a kid turned around and he said, Wingett, are you so poor you only have one pair of jeans? And I was. And uh, I was busted. And it was humiliating. He knew I only had one pair of jeans because it had a little tear on the pocket. And it showed every day. And you can't have all your pairs of jeans have a tear on the pocket in the very same place. And at that moment, because of that humiliation and that embarrassment, I made a decision in my life I had to get rich. Now, I had no role models to help me get rich. I had no idea how I was going to get rich. I didn't even know what rich was or how much money that meant. I just knew that I could not be embarrassed and humiliated like that again. So I made a decision at 13 years old. I was going to figure out what it took to make a lot of money. And it took me a lot of years to get to that point. But I went from uh, broke to pretty well off to bankrupt to multimillionaire. And uh, I worked my butt off every day of the world to make that happen. So. And uh, what did you do after high school? I went to college. Uh, then I went to work for uh, Southwestern Bell. I was one of the very first male telephone operators in the Bell system. Uh, then I moved all the way through the Bell system until I ended up as the area sales manager for AT&T for the state of Kansas. Left at divestiture when the Bell system broke up and AT&T broke up and started my own telecommunications company. Did real well doing that. Uh, expanded too quickly, made a lot of money made a lot of stupid hiring decisions and lost it all and uh, did go bankrupt. And yet, while that sounds like a horrible thing, and it seems like that wouldn't make sense for a guy who's now known sort of as a money uh, guru to talk about his bankruptcy, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. Because first of all, bankruptcy will put fear in you. And it is embarrassing, it is humiliating, but it will put a lot of fear in you because I had been a guy who paid my bills. And I was afraid not to pay my bills. And I knew I had to make money again. I had obligations. And my obligations really meant something to me. And I think that's one of the mistakes we make right now. We don't teach people that when you give your word, you make an obligation. You do whatever it takes to keep your word and to pay those obligations. And so I knew I couldn't stay broke very long. So I started doing whatever it took. I mean, I came home and mowed my neighbor's yards. That's humiliating to go to your neighbor and, and say, I need to do this. I trimmed trees. I did whatever it took for me to make money to pay my bills. I sold everything in my house. I had a garage sale every single weekend. I ended up with no furniture in my living room and all my spare bedrooms. and, and all. I just didn't have anything because I sold it all. I was like the guy who sold everything he had except for his bicycle and it didn't have any handlebars and it didn't have a bicycle seat lost his ass and didn't know which way to turn, truly that was me. But I, I did my best to keep my word and pay my bills. It meant that much to me. So after doing that, I decided really all I'd ever wanted was an audience, so I became a professional speaker, figured out what it took to be very successful as a professional speaker, did real well. I was a typical motivational guy for a while. Uh, I had also written a lot of training material for the Bell System and AT&T, and so I was a sales trainer. Found out people thought I was funny. Found out people pay you a whole lot more to make them laugh, and we'll teach them how to sell. So I became a humorist for a while, and then I kind of got fed up with it all and decided I was going to tell people the truth, and I was going to be authentic, and I was going to tell them, you know, you can't think your way to success. Wishful thinking is certainly not a wealth strategy. It takes work. And so I just started going on stages, and I've spoken to 400 of the Fortune 500 companies, telling them the ugly truth about success, which is, you got to work. How's that received? You know, one of the, the most fun things I, I do when I go on stage and I say something totally obnoxious, like, your life sucks because you suck, and your business sucks because as a business person you suck, and your sales suck because as a salesperson you suck, you suck, and... And your customer service sucks because you deliver sucky customer service. And you, they'll laugh at that, but then they'll just kind of pull back in their seats because it hurts. But what's fun for me is to watch people pull back because I have verbally slapped them. And then within seconds, you can see them look at each other and nod or just nod to themselves and start to pull right back forward because they know I'm telling them the truth. You know, I believe you've got to shake people up sometimes in order to wake them up. And I am not a motivational speaker any longer. I don't believe you can motivate people to go from one place to another. I have trademarked on the world's only irritational speaker. I think you have to irritate people with where they are. 
I'll guarantee you I can make you so irritated with where you are, you'll do anything to go someplace else. And really, I think that's the key to change, the key to motivation, the key to all positive change in your life in every single area, is you have to first become uncomfortable. I want to make people uncomfortable because I think change comes from being uncomfortable. If you're comfortable, let's say I'm comfortable in this chair right now, and I just sit here, I will sit here as long as I am comfortable. The moment I become uncomfortable, I will shift and I will move and I will change in order again become comfortable. My goal is to make people uncomfortable with where they are so they'll start to make some changes. So they will shift so they can again become really comfortable. But people don't change. They don't make any, take any action as long as they're comfortable. First make them uncomfortable. That's my goal. And I'm good at making people uncomfortable because I try to remove excuses. We are all so good. We live in a victim society. We love our excuses. There are more reasons why people can't be successful, can't be rich, can't be healthy, can't weigh the right amount. We have more excuses. And so when you try to remove everybody's excuses and all you leave them is with themselves, and you tell people to go to the mirror, look themselves in the eye and say, this is my fault. I created this, my thoughts, my words, my actions. That's what's given me the life I'm living. And you've removed their excuses. Maybe for the first time at that moment, they can start to really make positive change. Not until then.